I'm just going to say a few words to introduce Reinhardt um, this evening. The lecture is the third, I think, in the series, in the Designing Fabrication series. Um, and we have two more to come, which are Nieto Sobijano and Nader Tarani. Um, in putting together the series, we, we really had three kind of concerns that we wanted to identify international practices. Um, are emerging international practices. Uh, I think the first concern was offices that are really trying to expand spatial repertoires um, that perhaps reflect or anticipate emerging trends of communication or uh, user occupation of space in our societies. Um, secondly, we were looking for those offices um, that I think are looking for ways to escape preoccupation with formal experimentation and address a more complex project of trying to integrate multiple systems and variables or uh, let's say uh, relational fields. And finally, I think we're interested in offices that really are exploring the convergence of digital design and manufacturing processes um, and looking for new models of practice or expanding existing models of practice. And I think Helen and Hard, who are here to lecture this evening are really quite exemplary of that um, and Reinhardt is going to take us through his work but their work for me is quite a compelling exploration of the relationship between spatial definition um, and user engagement and their work routinely kind of crosses boundaries of architecture and art um, to larger scale town planning. I think interestingly it also tries to engage with the question of sustainability um, but to try and avoid discussing it in purely technical terms and actually look at it as a kind of generative design condition which needs to be related to a much wider um, system of variables of values. Richard uh, is an Austrian architect and researcher. He studied at uh, the University of Science in Graz and the AHO in Oslo. Uh, he's taught at the AHO, um, the Bartlett School of the Road where he's now teaching. Um, the architecture Col the special, the architecture in Paris, Kansas State University, and the University Hust. Um, in '96, he founded Helen and Hard with um, Steve Strangeland, um, and they have a particular. I think the practice is interesting for its location, partly because it's quite isolated, um, or let's say remote in a, a kind of the way you'd expect an office to be, but that uh, actually gives them some very interesting perspective and I think the way they engage with local industry and local conditions is quite um, striking when compared to let's say a traditional sense of place that is quite prevalent in Norwegian architecture. Um, they've gone on to realize numerous projects and have been widely, widely recognized for their work through awards and publication. They've exhi exhibited at the Lisbon and Venice Biennales and represented Norway recently at the Shanghai Expo in 2010. Uh, they have written, published, and lectured extensively in no Europe, North America, and Asia about their research on sustainable practices and methods. And I believe they have a forthcoming book due out in April um, called Relational Space. So please give a warm welcome to Richard Croft. Thank you, Alan, um, for the very kind welcome. I was warned of a friend um, to have a lecture here because he had a lecture, an architect, and he said the AA has the most um, aggressive students and teachers, and they whipped him apart, and he said, um, well, but they do it very polite in a British way, but I haven't experienced that so far. Maybe it comes later. But thank you. Uh, I would like to talk uh, today about uh, our projects and um, our way of working, um, which we call relational design, um, and this is also the title of my lecture, and I uh, will illustrate that with different, um, uh, with seven projects. The, um, this project share a common interest, and uh, that is um, to learn from nature's own design processes, and how they can be applied uh, to the field of architecture with the, uh, the help of digital tools and other tools. And this is what, uh, what I want to explain. I'm using um, uh, the, 
projects to explain that and also these kind of uh, themes which have been important in our projects. Um, first, relational design is about um, trying to, to establish a, a mutual encounter with the, uh, with the environment and, um, uh, and, and, and a, a kind of a partnership and, um, and use the resources and the possibilities of the environment. And uh, it includes uh, also not only sp specific human resources or behavior, but also um, material properties and production methods. And uh, it, it, it is uh, important to include life cycles and digital tools are important because they can increase uh, feedback loops and iterations and uh, can av help to avoid linear processes and, and production of waste. And, uh, and, and then also to, to kind of synthesize different, uh, weave together different knowledge fields uh, and processes, materials, and, and knowledge. I think that is uh, kind of the most inspiring challenge for me personally as an architect. And we learned that kind of uh, the way to work this way in, in Stavanger, on the, uh, uh, a city on the west coast, uh, and try to relate our work to this, uh, this kind of local resources, which you see here in this image. It's the oil industry, uh, and it's the Timber Heritage Center, and it's the beautiful nature. And, uh, and there, this is kind of a special place because it, it has been a construction site for the largest, uh, th this is Troll, which is the largest uh, floating platform ever built. And this was floating or was dragged out into the North Sea just in front of my living room window. So I looked at that and it was amazing. And this is like an ongoing research we have. Uh, we, how to grasp and understand uh, this this incredible uh, tangible and intellectual resources used in the oil industry and the transfer value to architecture or to, to urban planning. So we did, um, we worked with these structures and with the waste and tried to find ways to use it more environmentally friendly and in, in a different way. And we did uh, several recycling projects, for, uh, partly also for the oil industry. And the largest one is uh, Geopark. That was when Stavanger was a European capital. In, uh, and we asked the question, what is Stavanger center really need? What does it need? And found out that it doesn't have any um, playground in, in the center. And, and also, uh, the kind of the resource in the city, the oil industry, is not really visible or is not tangible. It's not possible to experience. So Geobug is developed by three different concepts. First, to reuse or recycle um, the elements, structures, and technology from the platform Frick, which was demolished at the time. Second, to uh, use or utilize the geological model of the oil and gas reservoir Troll, which is the largest gas reservoir in the world. And third, to include or to work with young people and youth groups uh, to program the space and to also design the space. So we had a countless of workshops with them and built models and drew. And worked also with engineers from, uh, the, from Statoil, which is the national oil company. They helped us to, um, to, to model the to make a model, a digital model of different sedimentary layers of troll, which we could use. And the whole idea was to make a, a landscape which is two to three thousand meters underneath the seabed uh, uh, to make them make it visible and it could make it possible to experience. And place it in front of the oil museum in scale one to five hundred. Uh, so the computer was like a more organization tool, and uh, of course also we modeled uh, 
troll with all sedimentary layers. This is now the top layer uh, with, the, with the twilling wealth. And we peeled in, in this uh, model to uh, kind of expose the different sedimentary layers and make a space which is or orientated towards the middle, uh, like an phi. And these different uh, activity layers are then programmed with the, uh, with the youth groups and built up of recycled elements um, of, of the Frick platform. And we, we modeled every single element, so uh, could use and kind of reorganize the space in that way. So th is the interesting thing about what, what that uh, there was a kind of a microeconomy in this park, because sometimes uh, one company would give us this piece here, but they say it can also go into the North Sea if it is needed. So it's like a storage also. And, uh, and, and we didn't really know to the very end how, how the park will develop because that was a part of the who could pay to give us or who, who is willing to, to sponsor elements to the park. Here you see all the different layers in the park. And uh, these are the twilling wealth in the troll field. It's especially in troll that you have horizontal twilling, which is then used as skating installation and uh, gym equipment. And uh, this kind of um, mushroom roof shows the, the, the top layer of the reservoir. And it is also a covered stage, outdoor stage. And these concrete mats are used to protect uh, pipelines on the ground, on the sea ground. And we use them to reinforce the, the steeper parts in Geobark. These are satellite dishes. This is the old ventilation hat, which is used as an outdoor cinema with the LCD screen. And then you have this bouncing landscape made of fenders um, and uh, trampolines. Here you see the cafe, which is a, a protection cover, which we didn't really use because we didn't have money for it. Um, and uh, there is a water jet cutting company who, who cut it out recycled uh, pipes and uh, according to the, the top of the reservoir, and they are then filled with amplit, which is a special concrete of uh, invented by Startoil to fill, which doesn't shrink, to fill pipelines. This is the bicycle jump. And the sedimentary foldings are then built in concrete, and they are the, the galleries for street art and graffiti and changing all the time. A personal basket, uh, this is used to lift up workers up to the platform. Um, this is the carousel. And um, yeah, the, the graffiti kind of spread out, and then the politicians wanted to forbid uh, to use these walls, but luckily they didn't manage to stop it. The project was meant to be a temporary park only for one year, but now it's uh, so uh, popular that politicians and, uh, and users want to keep it. I don't know how long, but uh, it, it helped that the MoMA has, has now bought a, a model of the Geopark, and the Queen of Norway has given it as a present to the director of the MoMA. Uh, so now we hope that um, it can be. But it was a self-generated project, and we started it, and we financed it, and I think that is really, really interesting for architects to do this kind of projects where economy and where uh, negotiation and where materials and where uh, the production uh, is, is a part of the design phase from day one. It's, it is kind of embedded in, in, in the design. Now I'm, I'm going to a very different project. Uh, it is the first project where we um, tried out um, kind of prefabricated um, use digital tools to, to design prefabricated uh, ho house, uh, houses or projects. And um, it is a housing project with 360 units uh, we made together with the company PPHG from Vienna. It is also an urban plan. Um, and uh, what we wanted to try was to avoid a typical sub-urbanization by kind of making a quite dense area, 
but still keeping some of the qualities of living not in, in the city center. The idea was to connect existing roads with the uh, undulating roads, uh, which then uh, expand to shared spaces, to kind of squares, uh, to use the existing stone walls with the very beautiful ve vegetation as the green areas in the area, to connect the shared spaces with bicycle routes and, and playgrounds with different programs, and then having different typologies around the squares. Uh, they are all orientated to towards these courtyards. So uh, to make a kind of an area which really flows and connects to the surrounding uh, context. The first, uh, the first building uh, phase was 120 uh, units uh, with these five etched houses. And the core idea was this kind of social courtyard, uh, social meeting spaces, the courtyards, uh, there are also the, the cars are driving through, and there are different activities, different programs in these courtyards, and all the entrances of the apartments are from, from these yards. And there are different uh, typologies. You have like block, housing blocks, you have units with four units, five units, and single family houses. And uh, how the splits in between the houses are designed, this was very helpful with. Uh, with uh, sun study and 3D modeling and, and to, to kind of prevent fuse and sun, not only for the apartments, but also for these spaces. <coughs> Here you see all these courtyard spaces together. And, uh, and the cars have kind of to take responsibility and, and slow down for the pedestrians. So all the houses are made of prefabricated uh, massive timber elements, which are kind of uh, all digitally modeled and designed. And 90% uh, uh, of this project is passive house standard. Uh, so it was the largest housing project at that time, um, passive house. It's the one family houses with a common living room here in the middle where you um, you go up, uh, there's a sleeping room on the second floor and a living room on the top. And uh, they are cladded with um, untreated timber. It was very kind of ambitious for a commercial project in terms of using environmentally friendly solutions and, uh, and energy solutions, as a materials and energy solutions. It's still under construction. This here now is the, um, the living room leading up to the, to the living room on the top with this terrace. PPAG has designed this spiral house where the apartments go in a spiral up and up and you have in one apartment different views out of the house. This is the double X house where the apartments shift uh, directions. So there are four units here in this one. Quite complex uh, plans. But the idea was that every apartment has a, co a connection to the courtyard and also to the private gardens or on, the, on the back side. This is the block with uh, three units in each, each floor and the kindergarten beside, which is built. Uh, we also made the playground or parts of the playground, like here these trees with these uh, dresses you can climb on. And um, the challenge in this project was really not to digitally manage to, to, to uh, model all these elements and, to, and not the digital tools, but the interface to the local craftsmen and to, to the general contractor. And this is uh, something we have experienced in several projects. This interface is a, a huge design parameter which has to be taken serious and, and um, the project doesn't go so well, really. It has in the financial problems now. Um, and we don't know what, hap what happens to it, but it's a really a very kind of interesting learning for us how, how we should do these projects. And you need a package where everything is kind of taken care of, all the interfaces. This is the kindergarten 
which is working quite well. And a bit of the same problems we experienced in this project as well. It was um, a competition we won in 2005. It is a mountain lodge which is on the trailhead leading up to the Parpit Walk, which is a famous tourist attraction in Norway. Um, and in this project, we, we introduced something which we then followed up in every project afterwards. Um, and uh, what is the said that the largest difference between how nature designs and humans design is that nature uses uh, much more uh, hierarchies or levels of integration, like uh, Francois Jacob calls them. Um, a, a one hair, for example, has like six, six different hierarchy levels, uh, while an average airport has like three hierarchy levels. And uh, each of these uh, this, um, hierarchical levels has its own, its own logic, its own um, kind of commu network, communication network, internal and external. And also each level needs its own research and its own way to work with digital tools. And in the um, pulpit walk, uh, the overall form was like a folded roof. And uh, the, the underneath the 15 whips, then uh, the elements, um, the prefabricated elements, and then the components of these elements. And um, the mountain lodge consists of 15 double whips, which are uh, hollowed out in order to prevent a public space. And um, they kind of give the written determinate the rhythm for the guest rooms. And these, uh, the ceilings are nestled in between these whips, prevent sound transmission. The roof is made of the same material, prefabricated uh, massive timber elements, and cladded and isolated with, with timber. Um, and this, this folded roof, together with the whips, were the first levels of integration we worked with. And what was important is how we kind of uh, fit this quite large building into the adjacent landscape and in the, in, the, in the topography, in the peaks of the topography. We found out on site there was a rock and we bended the, the mountain lodge around this rock. Um, and this is also visible from the entrance. Uh, towards the west, where the, there is a more flat meadow landscape, the, the lodge is, the, the, the roof angle is flatter and the lodge is lower. Towards the east, where you go up on the pulpit rock, it is steeper uh, and has a steeper roof angle. Here you see this rock again with the bridge leading to the top. And um, the whips are coming out in the facade and uh, creating this kind of protected sitting uh, niches and covered, there's a covered entrance space. So the whole, this folded roof makes kind of covered outdoor spaces. But the real um, the development of the project accelerated um, and shifted through a profound investigation in the, in the uh, massive timber elements and its components. We used a system called Holz 100, also Holz 100 uh, from Austria, which is, uh, consists of different layers, which then are uh, plunged together with uh, peach taps, which swill after being injected. And in the uh, restaurant, we had the challenge of a quite big span for these elements, and we would need to make a laminated timber, which we didn't want. We didn't want to break the system. And uh, together with the engineer, we thought about to turn the build up of the elements inside and out. That means um, the diagonal layers, which are normally hidden in the inside of the elements, are, are put on the outside, and thereby the elements become more stiff and, uh, and the span less. And the whole uh, geometry of, uh, of these elements changed. So the industrial production of these elements, uh, it was possible to change that production. production. And, uh, and that made also, had a big influence on the whole space of the restaurant. You see here these diagonals. So it was really like a, the, 
to go into the kind of uh, conditions of these components really changed uh, more profoundly the, the space. It was a kind of a bottom-up um, design. And here also how these blocks, uh, blocks then are visible in the space. The niches are orientated towards the view. You can sit in between, it's more intimate sitting spaces. Uh, in this project, we just understood the importance of a, of a common uh, model, to have a digital model where everyone works together. We didn't have that here, so the, the engineers worked on a different model, and it was very difficult to have iterations and, and feedbacks. So that's absolutely necessary. And here you see uh, the massive timber element. It's a fiber, um, timber fiber isolation. It's a waxed timber plate, and it is a cladding. So it's a, uh, the components are vapor permeable, completely open. It's not, not any plastic or anything which. The difficulty with this was that when you design all these massive timber elements, you have 60 centimeter on the outside. So really to meet that the points on the top of the roof would meet where they should meet was nearly impossible. And uh, we had to design countless of details. It was a nightmare and um, a lot of work. The structure is also the visible surface in the cabin, sleeping room, and um, so, so it's, it's every, everything is kind of, it's, it's nothing is covered, it's, it's like a open, comes close to also to, to passive house standard, and um, was one of the first building in Norway, built that way. Here you see Stavanger in the background. I'm not allowed to open the bottle because I can pour water on the computer, I will be careful. <coughs> and uh, while the parents are sitting in the mountain lodge, um, the kids can sleep in cabins uh, around the mountain lodge. There are, uh, is a project developed together with our client, uh, the Tracking Association, um, which is called Base Camp. And we went around in the forest and tried to find locations for these cabins. The tree camp is made of steel wings covered with, uh, with um, cotton. They're connected with hanging bridges. In each one, can three can children sleep. The rock lodge is hanging in the mountains it, um, on steel wires. And in between the pressure sticks, you have the beds that where you sleep. So if you go to bed, you have to climb up on the, on the rocks. And if you fall down, you fall down on your neighbor underneath. So these are also, the beds are also security um, nets. Um, and the pattern of the rock, the cracks we painted on the outside, and they also make the windows of this. And the third one is uh, at the water. Uh, where you can go with the boat, and it's pr mainly a covered K, uh, where you sleep in hammocks in between the columns. And if it's if it's raining, you can roll down the uh, textile. The idea with this base camp was the children learn to to play and to live and and to use nature, to be outside, and uh, it's used very much. There, it's book the whole year, I heard, um, even in winter. Um, the theme for the expo in 2010 was uh, uh, a better city, a better life. It was about sustainable urbanism. And um, to build a pavilion for only 140 days is not so sustainable at all. And so th the challenge we saw with this project, and we didn't want to do this competition in the beginning, was to uh, find a concept that the meaning uh, of the pavilion was uh, really uh, significant after Expo. And that led us to an idea of um, 
loose components which you easily can dismantle and, 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 and build up it again, um, and which you can use in different ways after the pavilion. So in the, in the period of the pavilion, uh, the 15 trees are standing together, um, and then they can be standing free each, each um, and can be used as park installation or as playground or as, 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 a, as a public space. We investigated with uh, um, students of the University in Tongxi in Shanghai and Hust in uh, Huangshu about possible ways to use these trees and had a, a lot of concept. And the orig original idea of this project was that the trees are designed together with um, people who have been um, relocated from the expo site to other parts in Shanghai together with uh, research groups or research persons from Norway. And then they come back to the site on the, on the expo and are, are the, the exhibition concept. And that was f too difficult for, too completely un, un, uh, ac acceptable for our client. Uh, so we had to um, kind of leave that. But still, uh, the trees are possible each to, dis to be dismantled, to be transported, and be built up in six hours, and and uh, and they are they can stand alone for themselves. Um, the levels of integration is again the, the whole pavilion, the, the four different characteristic Norwegian landscapes, the fifteen trees, and then the components of the trees. And uh, in this case, in the expo, with very short time period and a lot of cooks involved. Uh, this kind of design layers were extremely helpful to to um, adapt to all the different um, influences in the design phase. Like in most projects, we start so in in the middle, as in not the overall form, but also not the components, the 15 trees, and uh, the, the the form of these trees and also the amount or the connection of these trees, the, the trees changed. Uh, quite la late in the design phase. And um, what was also interesting, that the overall form was not so important, uh, the relation, for example, the relation to the site or the, the, how, how the pavilion looked from a distance. Uh, then the components of the pavilion, they were much more form generating and much more influential. Each tree uh, consists of four branches, a trunk, uh, and, uh, and the woods and the uh, membrane of Teflon is pre-tensioned. Uh, the tree here is made of glue laminated timber from Norway. We couldn't use glue BAM, which would, was, would be from China, but it was impossible to get accepted by the authorities. But all uh, the, what we call add-ons, the extensions, are CNC cutted uh, elements uh, in, in bamboo. So it's a combination. And they hide the infrastructure, uh, the technical uh, ducts, and uh, also the, the screens and the displays. They don't hide them, but they in integrate them. So each tree kind of uh, includes all functions. The whole pavilion also includes, uh, so ventilation and lightning and energy support and, and information and and outer skin and construction and infrastructure and so on. Um, and it's kind of self-sustained. This is the entrance tree. And, um, and there were a lot of influences on the way. And uh, the statical uh, parameters of the tree that it can stand alone were very kind of important and the tree were tested out in Norway uh, of Muelvan, the company who, who, who built the trees. The roof uh, was a pretensioned membrane, and the high points and the low, the low points should not drop. Uh, the, the difference between the low points and the high points couldn't uh, drop underneath a critical uh, distance. Uh, and so that means that each time you, you move one point, the whole roof started to, to move. So it was kind of uh, really important with parametric design to, to 
be able to design this form and change it. Um, the four characteristic landscapes are the coast, the fjords, the um, uh, Arctis, and uh, the, the coast. This is the, sorry, this is the forest, this is the coast. Um, interpretations of Nor Norwegian landscapes, which are also built in, uh, in bamboo. So what we wanted was not to make a black box and have the exhibition coming afterwards, but that everything is integrated. And that was also the difficulty and the challenge of the project. This is now the, the fjord landscape. And at the same time, the, the landscape and the exhibition uh, uh, that uh, included the air chambers for the supply air, which is blown in uh, through a perforated add-on. Like here in the fjords, for example. Uh, uh, the, the internal exchange of information and interdependency in between the different levels of integration was highly complex and constantly changing, as I said. And uh, just until the construction phase, there were a completely different uh, team involved in the interior, but everyone worked on the same, uh, on the same digital model. This is now the, the waves, and this is the forest landscape, the fjords. We intended really a kind of sensory experience uh, and the combining visual and tactile and auditory and physical stimuli, kind of a stenographic experience. Uh, here you see the forest where the screens together with the ventilation outlets form a layer which, is, uh, which illustrates a cityscape and then behind you have like a um, different mountain silhouettes. We don't know yet where the pavilion is. It, it, someone bought it and built it up as a public space in a town close to Hong Kong, we heard. But it's still not. Uh, we just heard we, sh we will be involved in the re-erection, but we haven't really heard so much about it. It's, it's a kind of a secret still. This project was an, a contribution for the exhibition The Rest of Now in the Biennale of Contemporary Art in the Manifesto in Bolzano. We were asked to make a site-specific installation uh, in an alu abandoned aluminum factory of, uh, built in the 30s under the Mussolini regime. And the space was amazing. Uh, and what really struck us was that kind of microorganisms in a nearly parasitic way uh, occupied the building and, and the walls. And uh, we kind of took our exhibition wall and said, please don't paint it and restore it. Just keep it that way. And um, we, we, we used samples of the wall. And a biologist helped us to analyze the samples. And there were uh, cyanobacteria in the wall and fungi. And these are films from fungus which are similar species than the ones we had in the walls from the university in Edinburgh. And the mathematician helped us down to make a logarithm. Uh, after this logarithm, the um, uh, robot was programmed to uh, perforate the wall where the microorganisms are living uh, according to the growth pattern of the microorganisms. And it's like a water jet cut cutter. And depending on the speed of the water jet cutter, they the cut in different depths in the wall. And sometimes all the way through the wall. So you get um, kind of light in and, and water in the space. Here you see the, um, the fungus in the wall. And um, the municipality of, of Bolzano bought the piece, so uh, it is still there. 
I don't know how they sealed it. I just heard it did something with glass outside, but I have to look at it one day. And a bit in a similar way to combine our different modes, sensoric modes and digital modes and technology and, 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 and biology and uh, was also the inspiration for this project. It was a, started as a commission of the Victoria and Albert Museum uh, for a pavilion for play um, in the courtyard of the, the V&A. And we st um, started this project uh, by um, recalling how we used, how we played. And Steve and I were climbing in the trees in the forest all the time. And uh, how, how we can recall that kind of embedded knowledge when you climb in a tree, so you're making a playground or making a play space, and the play and the play space is the same thing. You don't really make a, decision, a, di a differentiation between that. And how, how can you kind of use that direct work, to work direct with, with trees. And that uh, led us to a, to a concept where we um, had different empirical or playful steps. First, to go in the forest and find trees, which we did extensively. Then to scan the trees, then to model the trees, then and, and play with the model, and then to to CNC cut the trees and reassemble the, the parts of the tree. And after weeks, we found these beautiful ash trees on the farm. And they are then cut it in, in uh, saw in half and the, the, with the, the company responsible for the 3D scanning, they, uh, uh, the first made a laser scanning of the original trees into point cloud representations, and, th and then they s subsequently convert this laser scan into a 3D mesh model. Uh, that's called also re-engineering. And, and we then uh, had these trees in a virtual form and used it in, uh, in our programs. Um, and we could also print uh, uh, a 3D printer scale model in scale 1 to 20, which we did in Sweden, and we could work then digitally and, and analog s at the same time. And after having decided on the approximate placement and order of the trees, uh, we worked on the inter intersection both of the branches and of the roots. Um, so this, like for example here the roots, um, and this this surface would be used for the uh, milling pattern in between the trees. So we did this exercise with all the trees, uh, and and then controlled really the position and the joints in between them. And then we, we moved on to the task of creating the smooth interior of the pavilion. And uh, we using characteristics of the trees, such as uh, knots or branches or, or fiber directions. And um, we choose to do this in Rhino because we find it easier to work with large complex NURBS meshes. We can, we can drag them and change them. Uh, and we started with this cylindric mesh and uh, following the directions of the branches and that we are sure that they are nicely connected also the trees and, and we create a seamless transition in between them. After a long process of uh, fine tuning, the inner surface uh, uh, we exported them back to form C to use uh, the final shape of the interior to the uh, Boolean intersection. Uh, and then uh, yeah, we, we use this, uh, this inner NURBS uh, shape to split then each trunk. Each operation gave us the main milling surface for each tree. 
And in addition to this surface, we also had smaller kind of milling uh, patterns like uh, grips for climbing or this um, poem about Ratatosk, which is a squirrel from the Norwegian mythology, which uh, climbs in between the, the roots and the, the crown, tree crown, and gives messages, sends messages in between the god and uh, the underworld. And this was translated into English. And then we had a kind of a, a plan uh, how to to uh, to put th for the for the milling company how to mill these trees. And this milling process resulted in a continuous furniture finish interior plane with a continuous uh, surface. It's extremely precise. And the poem you see here. The branches we decided to slice and to weave as a as a crown um, together. All parts of the trees, uh, this is trunk, bark, wood, chippings, roots, and branches uh, have been refined and reassembled into a new hole. And it's like a prefabricated kit. And uh, this we made for the buyer of the pavilion is the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Köln, who bought the pavilion. Uh, from the milling process, the chips were used in cushions to prevent uh, as falling protection. When kids fall down, when they climb, they fall into these pillows, fishing nets filled with chips. And uh, the choice of timber in nearly all our projects, is, it's not only because of the environmental uh, uh, argument, this is a fantastic material, uh, but also because it is an organic material. It is, has intrinsic qualities and potentials which can be used and uh, can, can be explored and has, have a spatial, um, extremely interesting spatial um, potential. And um, this um, we found before computers, we found that in the Vasa Museum in Sweden, um, where, where boat builders go in the forest and they find uh, different parts which they can use to utilize for boat building. Mm -hmm. And then they, they, they have this kind of knowledge about which parts they can use. And I think instead of chipping up timber, uh, gluing it together and making uh, then uh, complex forms out of, of glue laminated timber, uh, why, why not using natural uh, complex forms of the trees and trying to utilize, like the boat builders did, these forms. So we're building now one family house where we try to do that and um, see, see the qualities of, of trees and then go with the client in the forest and find the trees to build the house. And this was also the idea for the project we did here in London. Uh, um, we got invited to make a, a table in the test bed one gallery. Um, there are different architects. The exhibition is called Turning the Tables and um, uh, and the, uh, there are exhibited different models for tables. Uh, our project is called the Tree of Dining and uh, the idea was to go in the forest and find uh, trees or the parts of trees which you could then um, resemble together and using uh, the very strong connection between the branch and the trunk uh, in a con constructive way for the table. Um, here you see the branches and it's four pieces connected together. And this is still standing in in the gallery, if someone wants to see it. It is Tespit One Gallery. This is uh, Jael Reisner, Peter Skook's table. There are different, it's quite interesting project. Um, 
in this project, uh, we uh, were in charge for redesigning existing uh, office buildings and making a new connecting building, uh, which is the entrance space, uh, like a uh, like a lobby and the, and the, and the meeting space. And uh, we wanted really to uh, invest and test components with the highest cap capacity to solve all parts of the projects. And we cite the main component is a, a timber element of Lingner Trend, which is a German company, uh, which is producing this kind of very interesting product um, as, as the component, the cell in the project, which then the whole project can uh, evolve of. And uh, the intention was to connect these buildings here. So we made these walls of the uh, with Ligner Trend element and then fanned them in order to uh, demarcate uh, the entrances and making a roof uh, above the entrances, cover the entrances. We had to also have a distance to the buildings uh, because of the fire, fire regulations. And uh, there was, has to be a, a smoke evacuation in the roof. So uh, there was, of course, like uh, in, in many projects, the, the grasshopper model where we could change uh, the different angles of this um, the fanning. We could change the, 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 the height of the elements and the width of the elements and the, the amount of the elements. So it was completely uh, necessary um, because there were a lot of uh, different parameters on different consultants who gave us information about how, how to make these elements and put that together. First, the engineer said it's completely impossible. And then his father, who is 70 years old, he took over and he, he solved it. The amazing, good engineer. Swiss. So the whole, whole project was prefabricated in Germany. And this is now under construction. This we, we did shot a while ago, last week or two weeks ago. And um, and what is really uh, extremely interesting is that it is just perfect. It 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 is like a furniture piece. It is everything fits together, and um, yeah, the client is amazed. There are different variations uh, of the elements um, required at different points of the construction. For example, the green are uh, are the ones who uh, who are which are reinforced with laminated beam. The, the blue one is the one who are isolated, etc., which are part of the BIM model. And then you have blocks, uh, which are also pre-drilled uh, in order to put the elements together completely in the right position. So the seamings are very precise. And here you see the pavilion from above. The engineers uh, used the 3D models for calculating the deflection and also the placement uh, of the up to the 500, 500 millimeter long screws. So uh, the guides for the screws will be pre-tilled, uh, they, they, they were pre-drilled as well. The plan, the space in between, uh, around 130 square meters. The rendering and how it looks now. This is the reception disc, also made of the same elements, which just carved out. And the main construction of elements uh, is uh, covered by zinc cladding. They are isolated. Yeah. The last project that we show today is uh, a winning competition entry for a new library in Venezuela in South Norway. Uh, this is the site in between a, um, a cinema existing and a, um, a education center, learning center. And uh, we won the competition because we opened the whole site up uh, to the main square by cutting in this corner and organized the library nearly on, as in one space on two different levels. And the space is covered with uh, 27 whips. We learned from the Palpit Rock Mountain Lodge, and kind of developed the concept further. 
and um, they, they are uh, prefabricated and digital CNC cutted and they determinate the form of the roof which is then made up partly of massive timber elements and also cladded with uh, untreated timber panels, a bit like the Puppet Rock Mountain Lodge. Um, in this project, we, we developed, uh, so, so here you see again these levels, um, but um, what was really important in this project was to try to find synergetic combinations in the project and, and weave or melt together different elements of the building. And um, each of the whip consists of a glue laminated uh, CNC cutted timber beam or column. And all the technical devices are integrated. Uh, that means the air ducts, the lightning, the uh, electricity, and also the, the shelves, the bookshelves and the furniture, like the, in the children departure and in the newspaper departure. So here you see a whip that uh, consists of a laminated beam, an air duct, an uh, acoustic absorber, a banded glass cover, which also has the signs on, uh, the shelves and the, the air outlet. outlet. So there are not, no, uh, we wanted to avoid, we wanted to kind of melt these things together, avoid this typical technology you have with ventilations. And that costed a lot of research and prototyping. We, we built several one-to-one -one prototypes together with the company who delivered it, the Carpenter Company. And they are prefabricated in Norway and in Poland. What was important that you can, in between these whips, you can go and read your book. So you can um, kind of da have a very calm uh, corner. And if you go in there, it's the sound is completely away. It's kind of disappears. It's very strange. It really functions well. Here the plan where you have the entrance, the restaurant, the newspaper, the existing cinema, uh, the education center, and here the library, with this one large space in the middle and the whips in, in the written. And the 3D model, everyone worked on the same 3D model, and the whips really, the position of the whips, they changed all the time. Uh, there was so many components, or not components, but so many parameters. Every whip was their own 3D model, and uh, which we, we modeled, and uh, it worked. We had one. We, we were kind of responsible for the BIM model. Uh, like in the Expo Pavilion, also we tried to identify and test uh, requirements concerning the use, concerning the construction, concerning uh, like materials, the, the, the technical infrastructure, and see if whether they can be um, combined. Uh, and, and, and this, um, uh, and, and interlinked, and this helped them to save resources, energy, but what is maybe most important, that this kind of uh, synergetic combination creates an atmospheric space and a, a very strong, like, um, kind of a evocative feeling. Yesterday was, um, we were there yesterday. Here you stand on the higher level looking towards the square, uh, the newspaper area and the, the restaurant from the entrance up. The children, uh, where, they, where they're carved out, the whips. So they, they can be used in different ways. We wanted kind of one large space where you can orient yourself easily, but then you can also kind of have intimate space in between the whips. 
At the main entrance, the rib form the loggia, which spans um, the width of the entire square. It makes this kind of guest towards the square. And you see, all you see into the space and the ribs. And here is the, the loggia, um, covered loggia, where you have the outdoor cafe. It's the back side, where you have the sun shading in timber as well. And this is um, painted in two different colors. So when you drive with a car around the building, it, it really changes expression. And yesterday was the opening. I still uh, have a bit of hangover, and it was an amazing, uh, beautiful party. And, uh, and um, yeah, everyone is happy. Uh, so all these projects today um, are attempts to kind of weave together um, human behavior and resources different contextual qualities and potentials and intrinsic material properties with the help of digital tools into a relational space. And this kind of um, uh, implies the understanding that, um, that, that the environment around us has a kind of a implicit unfolding potential and that it is not necessary to impose uh, a design or ideas only to impose that on the environment, but also more to, to try to, to seek um, a interconnectedness or partnership. And, um, and, and see the space generating possibilities in, in every situation, in every project. And uh, because my lecture is called Relational Space, I, I, I thought it was good to have the, the last photo that is, the, is our office in Stavanger. Thank you. Thank you, Reinhardt. Um, we like to take some questions if uh, anybody has anything they'd like to ask. Uh, I was wondering if you can um, repeat the name of the, the concrete that you, you guys used in the steel tubes in the playground that did not contract, was uplit? Uplit, yeah. Uplit. Mm -hmm. It is a patent of Sartoil, yeah. which uh, yeah, I don't know if it's possible to use it, really. Because we only were allowed to use it in this park, but they didn't want that we know what it really was and so on. They yeah, no, I, I was supposed to write my bachelor thesis about it, and it oh, yeah. doesn't have a strain. Pardon? Yeah. yeah. Anybody else? wondering about When you visit the, the Borgen Stavkirke in, in Norway, the, the roof of, of the, the, the oldest uh, uh, roof uh, cladding is 600 years old. It's timber untreated. Uh, no, it's not untreated, but it's... Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this, uh, what we used was core timber, uh, peach. Yeah. Um, uh, core timber, and it's, uh, it's very hard. And it's... Um, it is. Um, it can it can last for hundreds of years, and it's it's especially selected. Uh, but you also can use other 
kind of timbers uh, sorts. You can use, for example, a coir, which is a normal timber, which is um, uh, impregnated with a kind of with attic, or you can use um, uh, cabonet, which is impregnated with a um, ecological like a west. It's a, it's a B product from a sh sugar production. Um, and the future is in timber. I just heard that and read an article about it. To really, uh, uh, you have calcium and have you silicium. To get the silicium molecules into the calcium, uh, and that means that, that the wood become, gets um, like a min mineral, has some mineral qualities and gets extremely strong, fire resistant and water resistant. <coughs> and that is a, there is a research going on, and partly it's possible, but you need a lot of pressure and heat. So far, it is not really solved. Mm. But it's a very interesting uh, future for timber. But so far, we use core wood, and uh, because I think that's uh, nice, it, you can uh, um, then treat it with uh, um, iron um, oxygen, and it becomes gray immediately. So you don't have this kind of yeah, to have to wait one year or two years that it becomes even, especially this is a good in parts where the rain doesn't come, like covered parts which would never get gray and that. Yeah. It's called iron oxide, Jan oxide. You can help me. Oxid is ox. I guess it's the same in English. Yeah. It's um, it's not. You just spray it on. It's very simple. It's not. Okay. Uh, I'm a, I'm aware that you kind of had a strategic rethink in, and that brought on your interest in massive timber in 2008, 2000, well, 2007, 2008. Mm. And the Mountain Lodge was the first building where that kind of strategy was applied. Um, and I was wondering in terms of you talking about your approach not being ever finished, but unfolding and emergent, how far into this um, journey or to what extent three years later your approach to timber has evolved and um, where you see that going? Hmm. Good question. Um, what I don't like about massive timber, there's a lot of quality with it and there, there are a lot of factories opening in Europe. There are no eight factories opening massive timber. It's like big business. They're cheap, quite cheap. They are professional. You can big, build big in big uh, style with massive timber. But what is not really resolved are the, are the connections, the seamings, because you, you put that together and there is always a kind of, this, then you have to put the screws on. It's not really, I think it's not really elegant and they have to type it and you got to seal it with types. The, there is no future in that and you use a lot of, of timber for something wi where we don't need to, to use so much timber. So uh, it also, it's a waste of material, kind of, the massive timber. So um, there is a very interesting product which is, uh, called um, top wall, where you use trunks, as it's like a log wall, but it's turned. So you use trunks and stuck them into a, a swill. And then you use the fibers in the right way. And in Zurich, they built like a lot of housing projects, uh, seven floors, six floors, seven floors, not a lot, but some with this system. But I think the future is more um, to use timber where timber is good, like hollow elements, which you can fill them with different things. A bit like the Ligna Trend thing, which is very interesting, yeah. where you, yeah, where you make hybrids and. Where, where was that? Ligna, the pavilion. Uh, that is in Stavanger, yeah. It's, uh, then you can combine uh, timber with uh, isolation, with sand, with concrete, with, and you don't use thick timber. Then you you have to have an isolation, which is, in a passive house, it's it's, thirty centimeter. And then you have the cladding on the outside, and you need the construction to keep the cladding on. So this becomes a very kind of complicated wall. And I think that's not really the best way to solve it. So, so we, we are kind of investigating in alternative. And there is two houses now in Estonia built in a different system now. 
and uh, I think that will be really interesting to see that. Which we, we are in a, in a group in Switzerland uh, researching on, on different components, timber component elements. So that was Hermann Blumer? Yeah. Um, I, ha I have one, actually I have two. Um, one specifically architectural, I guess, which is you mentioned that you always start a project or concentrate somehow on the mid-scale, which was very interesting, that the scale you're working at it with the design intention is almost like it's above the component, but less than the overall form. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's just large enough to give some spatial definition to the mm. project, but on the other hand, it has a weak form overall that mm. seems like it either could be extended or could easily adapt to circumstance. Mm. And it reminds me a, a little bit, I'm, I'm not sure if this is correct, but it reminds me a little bit of kind of Utzon's sensibility about weak form and mm. its relationship to landscape. Would you like to say anything else about that or is what would be your view on it? I, I, I don't know so much the uh, weak form of Utzon and this, mm. this um, reference. Um, what, what I think is really interesting about the, the mid-scale, if mm. that's possible, that is something which, which can go everywhere. But then you have to solve the cell as well. It's quite interesting. I mean, it, the, the best would be to, s to solve the scale at the, the cell first and then evolve it. But often it's, this is not possible, kind of, yeah. because you need the kind of spatial framework to come down to the cell and then it's good to start in the mid in the middle um, and that that is uh, interesting because it uh, it gives really a, a, a different uh, it, it creates a different way to work conceptually with the project because you you don't start with the overall kind of uh, macro in mm -hmm. form and, and influences but you 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 have to work more as an, with an additive field of more interdependent elements, and then and then um, they have to be so big that they um, uh, solve that, and then you can go down. But at the other hand, what I, we experienced in Venezuela is that this is extremely complicated. Uh, so in Venezuela, these uh, whips are so even though it looks very simple, it was very complicated to have this mid scale. Because suddenly the, the, these, uh, these components they perform very differently, and mm. but it seems like an opportunity to integrate different systems. Yes, whether it's ventilation or lighting or all yeah. of these structure, yeah. all of these spatial qualities, mm. that it's an integrated process, yeah. which is quite. What is is I think the failure in uh, then if you don't manage to solve the whole project in the mid scale, like in the expo, the, the for example the backside the, the business center was not a part of these trees. Or it was, but it was not really integrated. And it was not good. <coughs> it was really not solved. S uh, and so if you start a kind of kind of a collage with different things, the whole thing doesn't really mm. work. I think it it's, um, s sets a certain parameter for the whole project if you work that way and not in a, in a collage way where you have different elements put together. At least this my, that was my experience in the expo. That was and, and the other question was just something you mentioned earlier on um, about the question of interface and through the working process and particularly the construction process with some of the approaches and techniques you're using now, you said it really came down to this whole question of interface and the relationships between you and the other consultants and the contractor. How mm -hmm. have you found that as a kind of young or growing practice? How have you kind of managed it? Because very often in established forms, they don't quite meet the needs that you want, let's say? Oh, we, we haven't managed, really. <laughs> <laughs> I, th I don't think this, I think this is the biggest problem. It's the organizational problem. It's not a design problem. It's not a knowledge problem. It's, it's not a problem of digital tools. It's to, to get different, um, to uh, get all the different parts of the people involved um, kind of together and making a group which works together and understands the idea and and uh, the problem are the general contractors, in, in all because they want to build in concrete and they do things in their way, uh, and 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 you can't come around them. And uh, if you make an alternative, it's very vulnerable. 
And the Scottberg pro project is now that it didn't went so well, which is uh, uh, confronting because, of course, it gives a signal also to mm. other projects that this mm. is. Um, so I think um, now with the pavilion and the EPUC, it, it works perfectly because we really s carefully <laughs> selected a group and used time on um, making a team and and uh, that and it means that we as architects have to be in charge for a kind of a leader role where we are involved in the recruiting the, the right people. Okay. And that, that is, I think, uh, the consequence that we have to be involved in that process. That must be quite yeah. difficult to do with public projects, though, is it? I think it's easier with public projects because okay. um, uh, it's not so commercially driven. I think the problem are commercial projects where certain constellations just are like uh, established and they do it the way they do and they, they earn a lot of money with it and they're not interested in something else because they know that it's a risk and it would, it would give. And, um, and I think in commercial projects, in housing projects, this is incredibly difficult. Also we, are, we have tried 15 years now to build timber housing projects and uh, Skatbeck is the first one. Also we have like half concrete, half timber. Mm -hmm. And not uh, that I'm, I mean that everything has to be timber, but it's uh, the, conc the way general contractors build concrete is not really quality and it's not good, I think. And there is no future in that, but it is just worked in, it's, it is, it's, it's a mafia, a really a mafia, it's worked in, uh, you can't, and, and the same with office buildings. I think that's the problem and um, that means that architects have to invent, to build, think much more different. Mm. Also you have to take care of the whole package. And, um, and uh, we are doing a housing project now where, where we're also involved in the, in the financing. Okay. So we were like proactive also in the economy and uh, get, try to get investors into the projects. And, and that is a completely wa different way to work. Yes, yeah. And then you are start on a different level. And um, I think that's a very interesting theme, how, how to the interface to the commercial market. Mm -hmm. so competitions, public projects, is much easier. There, there you have a position because you won the competition. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Reinhard. So thank you everybody for coming along. Uh, see you later.